So my mother um, prayed for me uh, quite frequently, I think. And it was really just one prayer that she had, I think, all the years of my growing up. And that was, dear God, please give Matt a son just like him. And uh, it was because of my attention span. I just had this super short attention span. My mom would like, she would try to talk to me and she would like literally have to get in front of me. And even then she would talk to me and she'd get close and then she'd get closer and then closer. And then eventually she'd put her hands on the side of my head. And each time she's like, Matt, 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 Matt. And eventually she had my attention and my eyes were on her and her prayers were miraculously answered. And so I have a son like me, and um, I find myself saying, Reuben, Reuben, and he's like right next to me, Reuben, Reuben Thomas, Reuben, Reuben, and, and it takes him a minute sometimes to adjust and finally be like, yeah, and his eyes are kind of big, like, like he's, he's, he knows that I'm calling him, but he's just not quite there yet. And so now I know what my mom went through all those years. And, um, and not much has changed, to be honest with you. Uh, last night, my wife and I were having a conversation. Um, actually, my wife was talking to me last night. And um, after the fourth attempt of saying something to me, I finally responded with... Um, Okay, I don't remember what we were talking about last night. So um, I'm actually, uh, Ange, when I get home, if you could remind us and we can have that conversation again, that'd probably be a good thing. Um, so you're probably wondering, like, what does that have to do with our message today? And well, that kind of attention span is not what God is asking from us. And today our message is about standing firm in the gospel. And standing firm in the gospel means being fully captivated by Jesus. And so it's a contrast to my own attention span, but it's being completely captivated by Jesus, by the King. Let's pray, and then we're going to open up the word together. God, I, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for who you are, that you are the King of kings, that you are the Lord of lords. And Lord, that uh, you invite us into relationship with you. Lord, that you have made it a way for us to know you, the creator of the universe. Lord, that when we were offensive to you, Lord, you sent your son into the world to come to us, to make the pathway for us to come to know you. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning, this evening, wherever we might be watching this or listening to it, I pray, Lord, that we would be captivated by you. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So we've been uh, working through a series um, called Blood, Sweat, and Tears from 1 Thessalonians. And today our message comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 to 3, 13. And again, the title is Standing Firm in the Gospel. I'm going to go ahead and read that. And uh, starts with verse 17 of chapter 2. Um, again, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. So let's, let's hear what the word has to say. It says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. 
But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For we now live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? As we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. And so as we unpack this, there's some things that we see about Paul. Paul is standing firm in the gospel, and he also is seeing that happen in the people of Thessalonians. So um, but there's a few characteristics that kind of illustrate how Paul is standing firm in the gospel. And um, actually, there's eight of them. This is an eight-point sermon, so we'll be here for a while. No, um, it's, it's not exactly eight-point, but, um, but here, here's what it is. It's kingdom agenda. That's the first thing. It was kingdom agenda. He had a kingdom love, a kingdom partnership, kingdom values, kingdom worship, kingdom prayers, kingdom battles, and a kingdom perspective. So let's kind of, let's dig in and let's unpack that. First, he had a kingdom agenda. And we'll look, put that up there. He's a kingdom agenda. A kingdom agenda means it's not my agenda. It's not about what I want. It's not about what I desire. It's not about the church's agenda necessarily either. The kingdom agenda is about the agenda of the king. It's the kingdom's agenda. It's the king's agenda. And Paul was committed to the king's agenda. In Romans 1.5, he, he articulates pretty clearly what he's about and what he's been committed to. Romans 5, he's, been, he's speaking of Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. So his, his agenda, everything that he's geared himself towards is exactly that, to bring about the obedience of faith among Gentiles. All of us, all of us who aren't Jews are Gentiles. And Paul's mission was to reach all of us and not just, to, not just to reach us, not to just get people across some sort of imaginary line to accept Jesus, but actually to bring about obedience of faith. And it wasn't even just that was even the sole purpose. That was the mission. But the purpose was for the sake of his name among the nations. That that was always first and foremost. It was the, the king's name, the king's business, the king's agenda. And we know that that is also to be our own. Romans 8, 16 um, and 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So we are heirs, if meaning heirs, then we, we are heirs of the kingdom. We're the heirs of the kingdom agenda as well as children, that we take in the agenda of our Father. And not only that, that we're not just children. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that we're not just members, but it says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. So that, that is, that's what the agenda is about, is about representing the king, representing the kingdom. And we see that in, in, uh, in Paul's only, his own desires in, in uh, verse two. And he sent Timothy, our brother and God's coworker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. That was, his, that was what he was about. That was what his intention was. 
And later on, he, in his prayer, he says, to establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. So his agenda is, again, about not about himself, not about um, what he wants to accomplish, but what the king wants to accomplish in the lives of these people. That is about being devoted to the king's agenda. And so the question this morning for you, and, and as we go through these, I'm going to have one or two questions for you just to ponder. You may want to write these down um, or just think about them, or it might be one that stands out to you. But what's your agenda? Is your agenda, your life agenda, shaped by the king and his mission? Is your agenda for your life marked by being an ambassador for Christ? Is your agenda shaped by that motivation to help all people come to know him? And not just know him, but to live in obedience to him. So his kingdom agenda, it was motivated by a kingdom love. And um, it's not a love that's exclusive. It's not a love that is limited. It's a love that is free, meaning that it doesn't cost the recipient anything. And it's a love, on the other hand, that is costly. Though it doesn't cost the recipient, it costs the person giving it. And so that's the kind of that's what kingdom love is about, that we are called to a costly kind of love. And we see that in Paul. We see that in his, his desire to see them. But he said, you see this in, in verse 17. It says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly with great desire to see you. You see this love that he has for these people. Though he's, he's, he's left them, he's gone on, um, he's in Athens, he has this desire for them and for their well-being in their relationship with God. He has this deep, profound love. And it's not a love that's reached any type of capacity. And so my question for you is, do you have a kingdom love this morning? Do you have a love for the people around you? Or are you limited? Are you limiting yourself to only loving certain people? Are you allowing God to expand your capacity to love the people that are on your path? The people that are in your life throughout your life? And is your love costly? Are you making sacrifices? Are you setting anything aside to love the people around you? See, that is what kingdom love is about. That's what Paul did, and that's what God invites us to. And this kingdom love, the, the, one of the really cool things about this is that we have kingdom partnership. It's a, a kingdom love that is shared in partnership. And um, I think this is one of the, the most exciting things. Is it's, it's not a go-it-alone mission. It's not to be done in isolation. It's partnership with God. I love what Paul says of Timothy. Timothy, our brother in God's co-worker. The, the, the idea that Timothy, the idea that Paul is working with God, that it's not just that God's just sent him to go do something, but actually there's this partnership with God. Imagine that, that I get to partner with him in what he is doing. Man, no, no better place to be. No, nothing more exciting than to be co-working with God. It's also a partnership with others. You see Paul's partnership with Timothy and then the other ones that are with him that aren't named. Um, there, there's a partnership with with people, and that's what the kingdom um, agenda, the kingdom mission is about, that we are to partner, we are to partner with God, but partner with others. M my wife and I, this is something that we talk about regularly. We talk about how we can see people come to know Jesus. How can we be building relationships with people in our, our, uh, our community? We, we pray for it regularly. 
Um, We shape how we spend our time together around the kingdom mission. Um, We we cultivate relationships with others for for the kingdom. And that's one of the things we we catch up, Angie and I catch up each week. And one of the things we talk about is is who we're going to be intentional with, who we're going to take some time to either have into our house or we're going to spend some time with them because we want them to come to know Jesus. As a staff, we partner, we, we talk about it. We talked about it this week. We talked about what's your outreach temperature. We talked about um, encouraging one another in sharing our faith. We talked about um, spurring each other on. And so there's a partnership. We're not meant to do this alone. And so my question to you is, are you seeing yourself in partnership with God? Do you truly see that partnership with him? Is that the way you're operating? Are you partnering with others for the kingdom? Are you, are you actually inviting others into that partnership with God? Are you inviting others to join you in what you're doing? And so the next one is kingdom values. Is Paul had kingdom values. And these are not values of comfort. They're not values of complacency. They're values of sacrifice. They're values of intentionality. In, uh, in 3.1, we see that in Paul. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. So Paul was willing to set aside his own comfort for the sake of the kingdom. He was willing to, to be alone. He was willing to, to send off his partner, somebody who was a partner in the gospel with him. He was willing to make that sacrifice because he had kingdom values. So the kingdom values are values of sacrifice. They're also values of intentionality. He was intentional. And so his values were about being intentional with a group of people that he would pursue and that he would help them, as we've talked about already, enter into the kingdom of God. So with this, where are you intentionally spending your time for the sake of the kingdom? Where are you intentionally spending your time for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the gospel? What are you sacrificing for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the gospel? Now, I'm not talking about, oh, I'm sacrificing my time to, to, um, to help with one of the church programs or ministries. That's not really what I'm talking about. Paul had a regular habit of going to synagogue. So that was his church Sunday, uh, well, Saturday experience. So I'm not really talking about that. I'm saying, how are you sacrificing your time in the week? How are you making sacrifices to help people come into the kingdom of God? That is what having kingdom values is about. But then kingdom worship. This is what Paul had. It was kingdom worship. And it's not shaped by style of music. Now, one of the things I love about the street and I loved about the worship that we've heard so far is that um, it's, there's so much talent here at the street. There's so much talent in, um, in, in singing and in playing and also in worship leading. That's one of the things that I, I really love about the street, that, I, that when I come and just be in the presence of God and, and be led with, with skillfully played music. I love that. But that's not, what, that's not really what kingdom worship is about. It's... it's um, It's not also shaped by some distant past experience. That's not necessarily kingdom worship because I experienced God one time in the past. It's shaped by God's current presence. It's shaped by God's current work. And I I love this in verse 9. It says, For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? 
In, in the NIV, I think it is, it talks about in the presence of our God. And so when they, go to, when they go to God, when they're in the presence of God, they have thanksgiving, they have worship, they have celebration. But why? It's because of what God is doing currently in the lives of his people. It's not just something that's happened in the past. It's not just because the music's really good. It's because they're in the presence of God and they have seen him do marvelous things among his people. And so my questions for there are actually on my next page. Are you stepping into his presence? Are you, are you stepping into his presence and, and taking note of being in his presence? Are you, are you celebrating what he is currently doing to further his kingdom? Are you, do you have stories in your life that you can celebrate? Are you, have you been paying attention to where God is at work so that you can celebrate currently what he's doing? And if you haven't, if you're not seeing it, God at work, then I, I just encourage you. I, you know, um, I, I actually wanna pray for you today. That, that man, and that's, that's my prayer right now, that God, you would, you would open our eyes to see where you're at work around us so that we can celebrate what you're doing. Lord, so we can see and know, man, that is God. Man, the creator has, has intervened. Praise Jesus. That's my prayer for you. He knew that there were um, kingdom battles that, the, that his battles were not just about people, that were not just about circumstances that were beyond our control. Our battles are against a spiritual en enemy. Our battles are spiritual battles. Our battles are for the kingdom. Verses um, 18 and verses 17, verse 18 of chapter two, he talks about how he wanted to come to them, but Satan hindered him. There was a spiritual battle going on that was hindering. And so eventually he was able to get Timothy through, but there was, there was a spiritual battle going on preventing that. And his prayer and his concern was again for about a spiritual battle. In verse five, um, he talks about, I uh, sent people, sent to learn about your faith for fear that the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. And so again, he recognized the spiritual battle and he recognized that there is an enemy at work to prevent us from seeing people come to know Jesus, from seeing people journey and walk with Jesus. And so he knew his battles were spiritual battles. And so the questions are, what battles are you facing? Where are you being tempted? And where is Satan hindering the gospel in your life? Next was kingdom prayers. He prayed kingdom prayers. It's not prayers that their suffering would end. He didn't pray that, that they would stop experiencing persecution. Like that's not in here at all. He doesn't even talk about that. He just acknowledges that it's happening. And so um, on the receiving end, you'd be like, Paul, um, you could pray for that. Um, but that's not his concern. His concern isn't whether they are experiencing any of those challenges. His prayer, it's, it's not that their lives would be filled with happiness. It's a prayer that their love would increase. It's a prayer that their love would would overflow. It's a prayer that they would be blameless. It's a prayer that they would be holy. This is what Paul prayed. It's a kingdom prayer. It's wrapped around kingdom values and kingdom mission. And so my first question is, are you praying? And then my second question is, how are you praying for people? How are you praying? Are you praying for the people around you that their love would increase? Are you praying that their love would overflow? Are you praying that they would be blameless? Are you praying that they would be holy? That's the kind of prayers that Paul invites us into for the people around us. And finally, it's a kingdom perspective. It's a kingdom perspective that's shaped by the king. It's a perspective driven by the fact that he is returning. It's a perspective with kingdom urgency. 
two times Paul talks about the returning of Jesus and about having something to share, having being ready. He talks about it in verse 19 of chapter 2, about how he, for what is our hope or our joy or our crown, boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming. See, he's looking forward to that. That's his perspective. That in the grand scheme of eternity, what matters is Jesus is coming back. And then again in verse 13 of chapter 3, so that, that they may be, may establish, that God may establish their hearts blameless in holiness before God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus. So for him, his perspective that the perspective that he carries is one of eternity. That he sees that Jesus is coming back and he wants as many people to be ready for that day as possible. That's his perspective. And so, what shapes your perspective? What drives your perspective? See, this is what it means to stand firm in the gospel. It means being totally captivated by the king. It means rolling up your sleeves and with blood, sweat, and tears, partnering with God for the sake of his kingdom. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you are a king and that you share your kingdom with us. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us today to... Um, Lord, to embrace our King, to be captivated by you, and Lord, to adopt your perspective, your agenda, your values, your prayers, your worship. Lord, that we would be completely and utterly captivated by you. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.